No success in the world can compensate for failure in the home. That's why Club Wealth was founded, to help driven, successful, and busy real estate agents like you double their business while building a strong, balanced home life. Join us each week as high-producing agents and team leaders share their stories and unpack the principles and systems they've used to double, triple, and even quadruple their business while enjoying greater quality of life. And now, here's the latest episode of Club Wealth TV. Guys, Michael Hellickson here with Club Wealth Coaching and Consulting. I have with me the amazing, the fantabulous, as you all know, is the queen of the real estate universe uh, and needs to mount uh, her screen there a little bit or dial down the volume a little bit on her screen or on her uh, on her computer there. But uh, that being said, Coach Marie Benjamin, that wasn't uh, me. as many of you know, uh, is not only our co-host on the show today, but she is also a regular co-host and is uh, someone who... Three, just three years ago, was doing like 35 transactions a year. And all of a sudden now, this year, what did you do? Like 450 transactions this year. So go Sheree Benjamin. That is no accident. That's through an awful lot of hard work. Uh, and I might add it since she uh, joined Club Wealth. So woo Way to go, Sheree Benjamin. Uh, <laughs> Throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Sheree is uh, one of our coaches here at Club Wealth, as are all of our folks that are on the call today. Uh, including Mr. Brian Curtis. Uh, they call him Brian the Baller for a reason, and it's not because he's six foot seven and shoots hoops. Uh, it is because this guy crushes it in real estate sales and uh, in a little town called Bentonville, Arkansas. And if you don't know where that is, welcome to the rest of the world. None of the rest of us do either. Uh, but that's okay. Brian has figured out where it is, and he has figured out how to sell a ton of homes there. Uh, and by the way, I see that we've got, um, I said we've got Sandy Stites watching us. Good to see you, Sandy. And uh, so anyway, Brian's crushing it there. Brian's also one of our coaches. Brian does over 330 transactions a year as well, uh, not counting expansion teams and all the other stuff he does. Uh, and then, of course, today's guest. Again, I don't even know where to start with today's guest, but I will tell you that I've got to start somewhere. So essentially, all I'm going to say is it's Mr. Dan Baltzer, who is also a club wealth coach. Dan is a freaking baller. Uh, what's really good about Dan is not only does he have to plug his car in to keep it from freezing in the wintertime because of where he lives, <laughs> but, uh, but Dan also has built a team of over 40 agents, and, uh, and I can't remember how many transactions a year he's doing, but what he's going to be telling us today is, or teaching us today, uh, is how he's getting literally over 850 people to his client events, which is huge. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and so hopefully you guys pay really close attention, takes lots of notes and do me a favor as you guys are watching today, I want you to do a couple of things like Sandy's doing this. Well, uh, she's typing great comments and they really appreciate that Sandy. Uh, but, uh, not only would we love for you to post comments in the, in the Facebook chat, but it'd be really awesome if you guys, uh, would ask questions in the Facebook chat and tag other people that you feel would benefit from learning how to get 850 people to their next client event. So, without any further ado, and with no more gilding the lily, Mr. Dan Balzer, welcome to Club Wealth TV. Hey, guys. Thanks. Awesome, dude. <laughs> Let's do this. What do you want to know? He's like, hey, guys. Hey, guys. I'm here. I love it. All right. Well, good stuff. So, Dan, talk to us. So, first of all, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're at, and what you and your team are doing right now. Okay. So, I'm in the Minneapolis-St. Paul, Minnesota market. Right, metropolitan area there. Uh, what we're doing on the volume side, we'll be just touching uh, close to 400 transactions this year, so it's great there. But you know what? We are fantastically enjoying and putting on events and um, and creating experiences for and moving past just clients, creating experiences for the community and the people large. So it's a good time. And that's what we're going to talk about today: is how do you drive massive traffic and um, you know turn it into opportunities for you. That's awesome. And so, okay, so tell us this. First of all, you're doing close to 400 transactions. How long have you been doing that? Because that's not easy. That's a that's a big number. So how did you get to 400 transactions? A lot of people, they hear that and they're like, oh, well, that's out of my realm. I'll never be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Here again, I'm just, I'm just wrapping up year two with the team. So prior to that, tell us about prior to the team. 
Prior team, a uh, solo agent, um, doing you know what, 30, 40, 50 deals a year. Jumped in the team leadership, um, and I, I, I work to make the lives of my agents better. How can I transform them to be the best that they can be, inside and outside of real estate? And it's a shared mutual success, and we're all just crushing it, having a good time. I freaking love that. That's what I was looking for. I really wanted to hear that. Hey, look, just two years ago, Dan was a solo agent doing 30, 40 deals a year. And all of a sudden this year, he's got 400 transactions closed roughly. Uh, you guys, that's a very big deal. And I really, I, I, I'm seeing this and I'm highlighting this because I want everybody watching to understand that it doesn't matter where you are today, where you're going to be a year from now or two years from now can be light years different than where you are today. You just have to choose for that to be different. You just have to choose that you're open to new ideas and to a different way of doing things. And if you're open to that, and if you'll work hard toward that, you can accomplish anything you want. You just got to choose to do it. Uh, so good for you, Dan. Good for you. Thank you. Go ahead, Shree. You look like you're about to say so something. Let's talk about, um, Dan, got a question for you. And yeah. Sandy, speaking of Sandy site, she just jumped right in. And she wants to know, with your agents that you have there, how are you getting them to participate um, in the client events also, because I'll, I'll just say this as team leaders, um, client events or community events, um, they do take a lot of, a lot of effort, um, on our part. Um, and there's a lot of work that has to be done. And I know that in order to get 800 people, 400 plus people to show out, it takes a team effort to get that done. So how are you getting your team to, um, participate in that? And what is your team seeing as a result of doing all the community events? Sure. Well, um, if you wanted to take a note, what's golden nugget number one about this, um, when you're planning your events, you need to identify who are your stakeholders, right? Who is a stakeholder in this event? And those are the people you need to make happy. They need to have a positive experience from this event. Okay. So from my perspective, I have a bunch of stakeholders. I have the venue, the location, I gotta make them happy. Right. I have my agents. They have to be happy about the experience they have from this. Right. The vendor partners you have, they have to have a happy experience time. Right. Anyone you had involved and of course, the general public or the, the attendees have to have a positive experience as well. So you have to understand and know who it is that you are needing to cater to and set an event up that actually feels like success and a win for everybody. Right. So to answer the question, how do you get your agents to participate? Because I know they're my stakeholder and there is a benefit or a plus side to them. Plus, they get an experience from it as well. OK, now tangible outcomes. Yep. You get um, when we do this, uh, maybe this will come in discussion later, but we're tracking who we're inviting, who's coming in. We have a registration system where someone walks in and says, hey, um, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith. And this could be an online lead. Folks, oh, there's another nugget. Invite your leads. Right. Mr. Smith, who's your who's your host today? Oh, Agent Sean. Agent Sean's over here. And now you're walking to Mr. Smith to go talk to Agent Sean for the first time, second time, third time. They're still in the conversion process and doing that. Um, and we have other anecdotal stories of mid-level COs attending our event and then coming up and saying, you know what, I'm going to work with you guys because you guys do this class act type stuff. And it's just a reputation building that they get to be part of, right? So that's kind of the, the quick answer is how do we get your agents in there, identify stakeholders, and then create their experience with a couple of then quick commentaries of an example of how. One of the things I love about what you just said there is it's all about making sure that they have a great experience, right? It's about how they feel. It's not as, you know, you've, we've all heard the, it, I guess it's kind of cliche now, you know, they won't remember what you told them, they'll remember how you made them feel, yada, yada, yada. But there's real truth to it. There really is. Mm -hmm. And so anybody that comes to your event, it's not about, the event has to be perfect or the catering has to be spot on and everything can't, you know, has to be just right. It's about when that person comes in, I hear the first thing you're doing is you're, as soon as they walk in, you're putting your arm around them. You're saying, hello, you're asking them how they're doing. Uh, you're introducing them to their host. You know, if it's one of the agents on your team, you're making sure that they feel loved at that event. And I, and I honestly, I, I can't say enough. I really believe that that is one of the most important keys to success with these things. And, and the outcomes won't come unless they feel loved, right? If they just sure. show up to your event, it's kind of okay. And even if the event is really awesome, right? You're like, you know, whatever the event is, right? If it's, if it's this really cool, whatever. If they feel like you didn't care about them or you didn't take the time for them at that event, they're not going to they're not going to do the things that they would do otherwise if they had felt like you did love them. Correct. Yes. So and I'll come back to your next one. You keep having growth, right? As they return, they start looking forward to the whatever your event is. Right. So Dan, let's back up. How are you? How are you all selecting which events you're doing? 
And uh, how often, two questions. And how often are you doing them per year? Three times a year. Three times a year. Okay. Yep. On the on the large scale, that's for a couple of reasons, um, and it allows your sphere engagement. To then every time one th your monthly calls, you now have a pattern. It's you can the first call of the year is save the date. Second call is hey the invite's gone out. Third call is confirming hope to see you there. I mean it gives a reason to call your sphere and engagement. And if you're giving something, you're never asking for something, right? And that alone, just having spacing at three times a year allows you to do that. Plus then the other reasons to call your sphere. And we have a whole list of why to that. But it adds to that piece. How do you engage with people? How do you and you always have something to offer and something to add, right? Um, and then selecting the events I'm doing. Um, I'm picking events that have a little larger scale now that I've kind of we've um, proven that we can do that. So then on my agents can do individual smaller level events for if they want to do it for their own database, right? So I don't want to take up an event that can be that they can do on a smaller scale so that they can still engage it and grow their business. I do the bigger ones that they can come in and be part of, right? Um, now, when you're deciding what events to do, it's what time of year. There's a whole bunch of things to go in, right? Um, so it's it's what can you do like you know what it's my winter one i'm not going to be doing something outside for my winter one so you have to work within your what you can do but it it comes down to what do we want to do what does it make it work or whatever um we are removing the word client from events period it's not a client event that's Love gone it. um actually we're gonna start naming it our uh you know like a, in the spring we'll do movie fest uh we'll do a summer jam and a winter party or something like that and just name it seasonal or based type of thing like that so that you can always change them what it is but it's still under your branding and your piece of what's going out um and that type of thing so are you all deciding this just amongst your directors or is this something that you're deciding as a team as a whole so those of you who don't know <laughs> dan has a group of what we some of us call squad leaders dan calls them directors mm -hmm. um that are leading uh the team um for him so how are you all deciding with this? What types? Oh, of I'll take a I'll take a crew meeting and say, hey, you know, hey guys, throw out some ideas. What would you like? What would you like us to see? And this is you know team wide. So it'll be 40, 40 some of us in the room. And what would you like to do? We brainstorm ideas, right? Um, we don't come to a final one there because first I have to check out a whole bunch of variables. What can an event hold that? Can I have a venue for that? What's the price for that? Right. But I'll create uh, and have everyone involved in creating a list of things for us to go explore. And then final decision will be uh, myself and directors as we look at budget and costs and what's going on there. What makes sense? Right. Okay, so I love that you're involving all of them in it. And I also love that you're very clear with them about, hey, guys, you know, there's a financial cost to this and there's only so much we can do. Uh, yeah. Now, that being said, I, I want to come back to the reason why you do the events. Now, we all think it's awesome. And, and all, I think I speak for pretty much everybody that's watching right now and saying that, gosh, how cool would it be if we could get 850 people out to our next client event? But really, it's for you, correct me if I'm wrong, the purpose is not, hey, I'm going to get 850 people to this client event. The purpose is, hey, I'm going to create an excuse to make a phone call to my sphere of influence three different times prior to the event. So not only are you not just emailing them like a lot of people do, you're literally calling them three different times before the actual event happens, which, by the way, I've got to say, probably has a lot to do with the attendance you're getting. Is that right? Yeah. And it's, it's you know, it, you do a, a monthly sphere engagement, but as you get closer, you can ramp up your touch points. Hey, did you get the RSP? I haven't seen you. I just want to know if you're coming. And because I need a head count or I need this, right? So you can actually have the ability to reach out to them many more times because you're just trying to see where they're coming and you're trying to give them something and should you be planning on them, right? So it's not a hassle or a burden. And at some point they're going to say, no, I can't make it. Okay, that's fine. I hope to see you at the next one. Or, oh, right, I haven't put my calendar yet or whatever. I mean, I myself, even with my sphere, I've been seeing people at the, you know, your your kid event that you see the parent with, you've been trying to get them. I've grabbed their phone and said, didn't put in the registration link and said, sign up, right? And you just drive traffic there wherever you go. But it's, oh, hey, I meant to see it. Yeah, sorry, I haven't seen it. But it's that persistence. But it allows you to have multiple touch points and frequent touch points. And let's go. Go ahead, Sheree. Sorry. So I I want to just talk talk about the agents who are not, who don't have a 40-plus person team like you do. The agents who is them and maybe a plus one, them and an admin. You know, right. I uh, we recently had an agent who tried his first client event, didn't get a lot of people there for his uh, Santa event. Um, that he did. I, can, I can answer that question for you. I got it. Yes, let's go. Okay. 
And I just was talking with one of my coaching clients on this, and they were thinking about, you know, as pictures with, right? Think about it. The thing you're creating has to be a big enough hook to interrupt their daily plan schedule, right? A picture with the Santa is a nice add-on. It's a nice perk. And actually, I deploy that differently. But it's not that big of a draw to get massive amounts of people for a picture only. Okay, I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna drive 20 minutes to get to a location for to stand in line for 10 minutes to have a 30 second picture point and then to leave, and drive home another 20 minutes. Meanwhile, I had to figure out what the outfits my kids are gonna wear, and that was a fight and a half. And it took me half hour to get out the door to get to that. And now I spilled hot chocolate because you're gonna have cookies there on her brand new white dress. And right, so okay, like a dad with experience. <laughs> but, I mean, so when you think about it, again, what's the experience my attendees are going to have, and is the hook big enough, right? So here's what you do with the like the picture piece, right? You create, do this, fine here, combine it with a pie day. Come get a pie, mix and mingle with friends. There'll be some kind of games there, and you get your picture taken with Santa, right? The the picture with is an and, but what's beautiful about that is when people register or you're inviting leads or whatever, they may give you a fake email for whatever to register but now you take the photo opportunity what's the best email to send you your photos they're going to give you the legit one because they want the picture of themselves right. so now you're going to get pure data it's another hook to get them to enter information register and register for them and whatever right but the picture in and of itself is not a big enough draw to get a large number of folks right you, you're going to get some who are over loyal to you you get 20 people and those are the folks who will bleed for you no matter what right uh, but to scale it up you have to combine it with an experience, right? And when you're thinking about how to create the experience, there's two rules here you want to control, okay? You want to control where their feet go. So as you plan your event in the space, you need to walk what's going to go. I'm going to walk in the door, step here, register here. Where's the next step? Okay, turn to left. Now, what? one, what do I see? Because you, you then want to be everywhere their line of sight is, okay? So you have to be everywhere the line of sight is, give them clear directions, and move them through the space to create. If you can control their feet, you're going to control their experience, right? Take a left. Great. But if I take a left and I'm running into a wall, that's a problem. Or if I have to take a left, that means my vendor over here to the right is going to get ignored. That guy's a stakeholder and he's not getting happy. So you have to somehow then drive the feet to the vendors, right? Now, here's a key nugget on driving feet to vendors. We all do prizes, giveaways, or whatever. Create games, create experiences. Hey, you won a prize. They get a ticket to the vendor, and they have to go to the vendor booth to collect their prize. They don't get it at the game. So right? I got I to jump in here for a second, Dan, because there's a couple of things you're going through right now that I think are super important. People don't realize, like when we do the big events, right, the Listing Agent Boot Camp and the buyer, uh, Business Strategy Mastermind Conference, all these big events that we do, we spend hun literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to accomplish exactly what you're talking about right now. It's got to be an all-encompassing experience. We look at it from a Disney perspective, right? How would Disney do this? You know, how would this be different? You know, what is the difference, by the way, between a Disney and pretty much everybody else out there, right? Every step of the way, the look, the feel, the smell, the, the entire experience is what Disney decides it's going to be for you. And what you're telling us is that you're doing that with your client events. You're making sure that at every turn, if they turn left, you are controlling what they see and you are well aware before they even show up to the event what they're going to see to the left and you're making you know, like your whole driving them back to your vendors that's huge first of all that you even have vendors there that are obviously paying to be there and that you're uh, incorporating them in with prizes and games and giveaways and all this other stuff to really make them a part of the overall experience dude now they get to build a relationship with your clients and what are they going to do they're going to endorse you what else are they, what, are they, what do you think they're going to say bad things about you of course they're going to endorse you right, right. and so I mean, it's just, it's brilliant. And, and I, I really hope people are listening to this because when you start really thinking differently about client events and you start going to this level of detail, whether you're a solo agent or a massive team, you're going to get better results. You're going to have just, even if you only had 40 people show up, who freaking cares, right? Because they had a world-class experience the next yeah. time they're going to bring friends. Yep, exactly. And it's the same rule, right? You walk in, what's the venue? Where am I going to go? Things to look for, choke points. Choke points. Where are traffic choke points? Don't create them. Solve them. Okay. What is again? Everything is what is the experience the attendee is going to have. Okay. Oh, I'm going to have to wait in line here. Why am I waiting in line here? Or what can I do while you wait in line here? Right. Or whatever it is. Keep them moving. Keep them occupied. Keep them having a good time. Right. And this applies to any of the events. You said no matter what the size is, you know, you're engaged and they're having a good time. You're what the piece there. Right. 
Now, to the agent and the admin plus one, I learned this, our first event in 18, we had 650 some folks and my agents were the labor and worked everything. Mm -hmm. Mistake. Because what can't they do then? They can't network. Yep, they can't engage. Yep. Mm -hmm. So now, guess what? So my 851, I have that problem. I now have to have things worked, not by my labor pool. What do we do there? Well, here's how we solved it. We ran a silent auction with some really cool stuff to that, that was raising money for charitable causes. One of the charitable causes was the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts provided the labor. Okay, yeah, that's really cool, actually. Now I got the community that's involved. Super good idea. Right. Whatever charity you're supporting, get them to provide the labor for the actual event, which they'll more than happily do. They've probably got tons of volunteers already. They're a freaking charity. Of course they got volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then I created an event where I didn't have to pay it out of my pocket. It was the revenue from whatever this was. So there was a third hook. We had a silent auction, right? And that silent auction revenue was the money we used for donations to the two events we sponsored for the two uh, uh, nonprofits or, you know, community groups we sponsored. So Dan, there's a benefit of the benefit to that whole charity thing and getting their people to do the, the uh, to get their people to do the, the, uh, the, the labor at the event, right? If you get a bunch of Girl Scouts show up and they're going to be the labor for the event, guess who shows up with them? Their parents, mom and dad, and guess who's now a part of your sphere of influence, dude? I am brilliant, seriously, freaking. Oh, brilliant. and now what happens now is they've asked us, "When's your next one? Can we help again?" So now yeah. I have the labor pool asking to help us again. Yep. Well, I think, and in, in not only that, but those they can also get them involved in inviting people out too. Yep. That's why you're doing a community event and not just a client event so that so, these vendors can invite their people out so that the organization, the, ch the charity can invite people out. That's why you're doing it as a community event versus yeah. just a client event. Exactly. And then that opens up who your vendor possibilities, right? Have the mom and pop restaurant host something there and do a tasting, right? Have the local sports shop there doing, if you're doing a sporting event with some gear they can test out or whatever game they want to play around, you can actually then get bus local businesses in the community taking part. So you open up your vendor opportunities. Dude, that's freaking huge. That's huge. So let me ask you this. What have you grown in terms of vendor opportunities? What, what have you grown to and how did you get started? Because this whole vendor thing, I think is a, is a, is a mystery to a lot of people, right? How do I get, how do I get vendors to actually pay me? I asked my lender and they said, no. Or, you know, I asked so-and-so and they said they could. You need a new lender if they said no. Seriously, right? <laughs> I'm just so, so what's, what, how, how do you overcome that? How do you, how do you get people past you know, that, that hurdle? How are you getting your coaching clients past it, for example? Um, okay, so uh, you have to paint the concept first. Paint the vision. Anytime you guys are all salespeople, paint the vision of what this is going to be. And if you can open up to it's more than just this for my 15 clients. It's something bigger. Get them in there, right? Now, tip number two, uh, or kind of secret number two, is if and I'm pro, you've seen this in the Club Wealth pages, perhaps, but you've seen the videos of my event, right? Mm -hmm. Which means who was there at my event? Your videographer. Guess what? Now I have uh, social proof in a video that anyone who wants to, I'm talking to vendors, here's the type of event we do. Why do you want to be part of this? Here's what the last two look like. Go ahead and take three minutes and watch it. I'm going to bring the audience, the only part of this. Yeah, and you're bringing quite the audience. Okay, so what do you? What, give us some idea on numbers. I mean, obviously they're going to pay more to be at an 850 person event, but how did it start off? You know, what did you start asking for, and and what was the response you got? Uh, so yeah, let's see. Bring it all the way back, Dan. Bring it all the way back. <laughs> bring it back. So I'll be honest. The, the first event we did was November of 17, and we just followed, followed Michael Omar. You know, we all talked to him. We did the Pi Day. You've already heard about doing a Pi Day, right? Um, we did 200. Now, I bore the brunt of that because it was an experiment for all of us, but it was a, not too big an expense, and we had some kind of peace in that, right? But I at least got pictures of we got a lot of people. Next time, let's say if you're going to go, go big. I started doing that vision of I wanted to do X, Y, and Z, and I think I can get 500 people there, right? That was my goal. I ended up with 650, right? And Wait. go ahead. Yep. Did you say your first one, you had 200 people show up? For pies. Okay. So let's stop there. How did we get 200 people to show up to the very first one? Uh, uh, we call them and give them something. Wait, 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 wait. Did you say you picked up the phone? Yeah. That's the thing. It cracks me up. Like, agents won't do that. Like, and it's, 
Dude, does that just, it's like anything else on this freaking planet. You want to make money? And I'm going to, you know, we're going to get Brian, Brian's going to go, heck yeah, on this one, because guess what? You pick up the phone and you just assumptive close them on the pie order, right? Which, hey, just flavor, to see which kind of pie you want. Which flavor do you want? Not do you want right. to. I'm going to have it here. It's going to be waiting for you. The quick answer is, do you want pumpkin, pecan, or whatever it, your choices are? That's right. right. Make them say no, right? I mean, that's what, you know, NLP, and that's what Brian just crushes that with. That's why he's a killer over there. But uh, it's, it's... He's the silent killer right now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's... But that's... It. It's, we didn't ask for permit. We told them they're coming. I'm going to have a pie for you. I'm going to see you on Friday at whatever, and we're, you know, you know, and, you know, mix and mingle it. And we had in the lobby, and we had some, you know, uh, drinks with it as well. Come. So it wasn't just a pick up a pie and leave, right? The experience can't be thank you and depart. Now, I've had other agents or uh, talk to people, hey, I'm going to do a pie day. Oh, I can't make it. I'll drop yours off. Oh, hell no. Yeah, that's, that's, to to that's the point I want you to get to there is whether or not you're having them come because I've done this and I've heard, oh, Sheree, they won't come. I'm just going to load them all up in the car and go drive it all around. Who has oh, time miserable. for that? <laughs> so you are getting them, you're doing an assumptive close and you're getting them to come to the office to pick it up between such and such and such and such hours. Is that correct? Yep. yep. Bingo. And how many people are actually doing that? Um, what do you mean? Meaning I invited, or I did the assumptive close on 300 and 200 showed up. Now I got a hundred pies. I got to go deliver. Like I want to oh, talk we, about that. We, had like a, we only had like 10 left over. 10 pies left over. Did right? those then, 10 pies, did they come and pick it up or did you guys go and uh, drop it off? Did they eventually come pick it up? Or did um, you eat them? You yeah, know what? I, I really fat that week. I'm just yeah, kidding. I probably would have ate them. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You do it this way. I gave it to all my team because the bigger they look, the, the bigger they get, the smaller I look. So, <laughs> right. exactly. That's the Helixon way now. <laughs> As he keeps on shrinking. <laughs> the bigger, best I can, sure. bigger people. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a good question for you, Dan. Um, I feel like you pointed out earlier that a lot of people don't like to make the phone calls. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, yeah, but that's – and this one year is an invitation year. Hey, come party, right? You're just rallying your troops for a party. So let me ask, so let me ask you this, um, and I'm not trying to hold you to, but on the average, how many phone calls a day are people making on your team? 40, 50, 60? Oh, that's probably too high to be honest. Well, should have lied to me. Anyway, so <laughs> here, here's the thing that I'm, that I'm suggesting, and I think this is something that people miss. I don't know about you, but when I lead generated and called FISBOs and expireds and Realtor.com leads and Zillow leads, and not that those aren't all great lead sources and there's a million others, but when I do that 50 phone calls a day for six, seven, eight, ten weeks in a row, I get bored. And mm -hmm. one of the great things about this is this is an opportunity to do something different. This is how I sold this to my team because I had the same problem the first time I ran a client event. I was like, how did we only get 100 people to show up for something free? And honestly, I, I bought way too expensive pie, so it was good because I would have went broke if they had done a good job. But <laughs> don't buy $27 pies. That's my piece of oh advice. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Costco, $7. Oh, Costco, oh, $7. I could have made you some, some pies for 27 bucks. Yeah, yeah me too. Oh. Call me, Brian. New so we got a specialty pie shop here, which was great, except that, by the way, not required. Because Dude, no one I got really news for you. Their specialty is ripping you off. <laughs> <laughs> but here's my point, though. If I, I hate to say this, but we have to sell this to people who we work with because you know, we have to give them a reason to want to make this phone call outside of you'll get more business. Because, But if you give them the idea, how about doing something different? Change it up a little bit. And then here's the other beauty of it. We haven't talked about this. What's the follow-up? So I have a great event. What am I doing for the, let's say, the week after? Let's say my client event's right. on a Saturday. What am yeah. I doing the next seven days? All right, so I'll hit the next seven days question, but something else I'm inviting people is agents should be doing Facebook Live videos saying, hey, I'm having this big event, and just pushing out their social media as well. Put them on camera, put them on video, and publish it out to their, their networks and database there as well. It's, so it was, it was phone calls, yes, but it was land, sea, and air. We actually did a mailer invite. There's an email campaign for it. There's a link for registration. So we had a t bunch of different ways. And then they went live on video into their into their spheres and whatever. And it could be just them driving. Hey, folks, guess what? I, you know, My name is Dan here, heading home for the day. But you know, we're having a party on the 23rd, blah, 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 blah. And go, and I need to see you there. Comment here. 
if you're coming, I'll kick you the link or something like that, right? So, so let me follow up on that before you do that. So here's the problem I have with that, unless you it's an ancillary step. And what I mean by that is if I give the average person the opportunity to do a Facebook Live, they do it once and they won't make any phone calls. What is the purpose of the client event? For me, the purpose of a client event, one of the main purposes is to call people. Oh, yeah. So my point is that is if you're out there listening going great i just got a shortcut i'm going to do a client event all i'm going to do is do a facebook video send it out so we are in the and dan would i know this without even asking him he's in the and business and what i mean by that it's facebook live and phone calls and text messages and video text messages and yeah. a mailer because here's the thing if you, the amount of time energy effort and money that goes into these things if you call 10 people you have failed miserably because there's way too much opportunity here. It's kind of like the person who goes and does an open house, puts one sign out and spends two hours sitting in the open house, going, you know, it didn't really work. Well, of course it didn't work, but if you'd have taken one more hour and put out more signs and ran a Facebook ad and ran a Craigslist ad and did follow the, the Club Wealth mega open house checklist. My point is, if I'm gonna waste time waste time if i'm going to do an event do an event and make sure that this is what we're focusing on and i think the people who don't have success at these things is because they don't take every one of the steps and again if you're a club wealth coaching member there's a trello card for that so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so aka don't, don't half booty it i'll, I'll yeah, say right. it. <laughs> half, didn't you just say half booty yeah, I didn't want to say the other word. <laughs> so back to follow up. So what are we doing uh, afterwards? The week after, right? Now the week after is hustle. Okay. The week after is actually pretty critical. Okay. Um, one, you're dropping a call to everybody who who registered and said they were coming and we're not there. Hey, sorry didn't make it. Hope to see you at the next one. Hey, by the way, our next one's going to be in June. Save the date, but I'll be calling you again if you don't get them. You're talking about it or whatever, right? Your videographer has to pump out the footage to get out because then what you're going to do is you're going to publish that on social media and you're going to tag all your vendors so that they can set and spread it out as well, right? Because you got to give them all the love and the props, right? So when you're talking and scripting what your videographer has to do, you need to capture collateral that every vendor can use as well as what you can do. So there could be different versions that are created, um, but the main one has to at least feature all of the folks that need to be featured, whoever you have, right? Now, you don't want to tell the videographer nothing over two minutes, okay? If someone's going to watch it, the first version I got back from my last event was three minutes, and I told him to cut it down, and he was like, and he's very artistic, and he liked his product, and I said, I love your product too, but who's going to watch it past two minutes, right? But see, and, they don't see it that way. They're like, dude, I got it. I'm, I'm going to be a feature film director one day. <laughs> uh, he wasn't going there, but out of this thing, you know. <laughs> but I said, we're going to keep your artistic flair to it. That's perfectly fine. But I, we got to stop that too. So you have to have a pre-step conversation with your videographer of what it is you're going to do and know what's the collateral you need to capture. Right now, my event in the spring, we actually had interviews of attendees. So then I had a person with a mic. Uh, my PR person with the mic interviewing on a separate camera piece right there. And then that got embedded into the clip as well and, and for use. And there's, again, greater testimonial about why use us, what was the great, what do you think of the event, and that type of thing, right? So we had to identify who are the ones that we want to try and speak and th that type of thing. And then to the point of where's their eyes, even the microphone had our branding around it. So everything that you looked at was seeing us and what you Dude, know. Dude, you are so cooler than me. Ah! I can't believe I didn't do the freaking club wealth on the microphone thing. All right, that's happening. Like, oh my gosh, there's my big thing play. Uh, I mean, he's probably it's watching. the little things that matter, you guys. It really is. Oh my gosh, you just give me a freaking blown mind on that one, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Right. So the week after you have to get that, you have to get that published. I, I or my director, whoever knows the relationship to the vendor that came in is closing and saying, thank you. What's going on? I mean, did you have a good time? Was your event getting feedback there? Um, we're blasting out. Now we did silent auction. So now we got to call the winners because you didn't have to be present to win. We are going to do that collection piece there um, and get all that distributed out. Again, they can come again, come collect it. Right. So now I'm getting video and social proof of them collecting their prize, collecting their winnings and B-roll collateral for that. We had a grant like you do, we had a grand prize drawing, right? I did a separate little video that produced out and I announced socially, hey, Tanya, blah, 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 you are the grand prize winner of a trip giveaway, right? Um, and then a whole bunch of comment, and I tagged her on it and a whole bunch of commentary of, <laughs> oh my God, where are we going, right? And, you know, so that'll lead up to as well. So that, that week after is 
quite busy. And the best practice is to have, a, if not a date, a month, you're going to do the next one. Hey, we'll be doing another one in June, and you'll be hearing from us so that you can start prepping them, your audience, that you're, you're coming again with another big party, and you want them to come celebrate with you and get them jazzed up from it coming right out of the gate. Does that make sense, Brian? Did I answer your question? So I think you did. So tell me this. So what are you doing? Are you all doing any type of um, RSVP, something on there that lets you know whether or not they are interested in buying, yeah. selling, investing? Are you doing any of that on the front end? On the front end, um, there you know, there's obviously different commentaries on there. Hey, can you give me a referral or whatever? And I'm I'm hesitant to have them write, hey, who do you want me to call from your sphere in the database? Because if this is all about them, the experience you're gonna create, and I ask that question, it's about me, right? So it's what I really want to track down to is how did you hear about us? Right? Who's your host? Okay. Um, and and track what's coming there so I can follow up with them. Now, what ends up happening if I have 850 people who gave me registration because we'd use Eventbrite, we'd use register, and you, you, you get their contact information. I then can go and create custom audiences for future ad campaigns around them, right? So the most important thing I have is the data on them, and I will drip over them land, sea, and air through other, through other means rather than straight up asking them at the point of registration, hey, you just walked in. Who do you want me to call to sell a house? I'm struggling with, with, with that one myself. Other folks have pulled it off with really good success. But that doesn't mean our good connections aren't being made. And I'm going to let my agents who are networking the event network it and have it come up in organic conversation rather than a forced um, slip, right? Now, for tracking purposes, um, when my agents turn in the file, whatever we have, it's a commission request, we actually will start saying, can this, um, does this transaction tie back to any event? So then I can start saying the event tiebacks or whatever, right? So talk to me about the uh, no show. So when you're calling the no shows, what are you saying to them? They didn't show up. Yeah, right. And now I, we have some fun with it. If it's really close, personal, it's a tight person in my sphere, and they didn't show up, I'm just going to razz them and make it real, make it authentic. If it's someone I don't know, it's hey, sorry we missed you. We had a good time. Check out a clip of the video. Use that video to you know. Here's what you invent. We'd love to see it the next one um or whatever hope you're okay hope nothing happened to you i mean it's really all about them thank you or sorry we didn't see you but we want to see you at the next one stay tuned and then it's just a continued move back into regular daily programming for whatever follow-up you have for that reason for that person to be there okay so i'm hearing the jabs that you're doing when's the right hook come in i hear right the hook? jabs i hear <laughs> the jabs that you're doing i hear all your jabs that you're doing when is your yep. right hook coming right hook comes in Say it. I'm sorry, Michael. When do you close them? When are you closing them? When's the right yeah. hook coming? When's the hook? Yeah. So that is then the agent follow, agent level follow up. It truly is. Okay. Go ahead, Ryan. We can say something. Oh no, you're just typing. Okay. So. I want to come back to this, you guys, because one of the things that you've been talking about that's kind of been a recurring theme throughout this is it's about their experience. And what I'm hearing is that at every step, you're it's it's like you're not getting up there because I hear a lot of people say, well, what do I do at some point during during the event? Do I get up and get on a microphone and be like, hey, send me referrals? Woo -hoo! You know, like <laughs> like I, I'm assuming that's not what you do, right? No. no. Nope, nope. So at the uh, first event this year, at the 650 event, at one point we were doing live raffles at there. You had to be present to win. So then I did have to get up and do some speaking, but it's all about announcing winners and hey, and it was a thank you for being here, right? Um, at the other one, the, the one, the 850 one, it was me at the door just welcoming people because there wasn't going to be a public audience uh, type the way that was playing out. So we're still going to high five, know everybody, right? Um, uh, tidbit number two, whoever is working at the venue or your team, make them all wear the same thing. So my first event, the 650 was a movie theater. All my movie theaters were wearing, employees were wearing my shirts. Wait, the theater employees were wearing your shirts as well as your team? Yep. Nice, nice. So what happens though when somebody goes up to one of those theater people and, and says, hey, so I'm thinking about buying a house. Fantastic. Talk to someone who's not standing behind the counter giving you your popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Okay, so and let's come back to Sharice's question. So how do your agents, when they do the follow-up call, how are they closing them? How are they closing them? It truly yeah. is 
because we have spheres people who maybe we're just giving you know, it's an event to sponsor them as past clients. It's really going to be based on what they were. If they were a lead, hey, glad to meet you, and you had an organic conversation with them at the at the um, at the event, so you know their timelines, you know the piece, you're putting them into the right follow up campaign, right, and do them. It's not going to be hey. Hey, you came to my event, now I'm going to come meet you, but it's going to be whatever organically transferred and move forward, right? Are they an aspirational buyer? Then I'll put them into my aspirational follow-up campaign. If they're a research base, I'm going to put them in the research follow-up campaign. If they are straight up, it's time to transact, then we're closing it and try and transact, but it's going to be based on whatever it is they tell us and what we learn from them as we go. Okay. All right. But the bottom line is there's a lot of follow-up happening after the fact. Yes. See, and I just, I just think people just misunderstand the importance of the client event, first of all, and second of all, the importance of the lead up, you know, all the, all the pre calls, all of the mail outs, all of the emails, all of the, everything that happens pre, and then also all of the stuff that happens afterwards. That's how you turn these events into transactions. See, people got to know, like, and trust you before they'll do business with you. And what you're doing is you're setting the stage for them to be able to know, like, and trust you. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if, if what happens is they show up to your event and you're hawking them, right? You're like all over them about doing business with you or sending in referrals or whatever. Well, where's the trust, right? Like I trusted that I was going to bring my family here just to have a good time. I didn't plan on coming here so you could hard sell me. Uh, you know, this isn't a timeshare freaking presentation. No offense, Brian. Um, <laughs> I can teach you how to do that too if you want. Got your back. Timeshares, man. Let me tell you, that guy could close. Nice. Uh, still can. But, uh, but anyway, I just, I, I just think it's really, really important that we understand the human element here, and it's really, really important to. Uh, to really dive deep with people. And even at the event, I, I think for me, at all of my events, it's always my goal. And it doesn't matter whether it was my real estate events or our club hall events. It's always my goal to get a selfie with every single person there. Like that, that's a hard thing to accomplish, but I want to do it because I want the chance to put my arm around somebody, take my camera out, take a little selfie, let them know I care about them, you know, get that physical interaction that, you know, and, and that emotional connection that you really have to have the tape that take those relationships deeper. Go ahead, Brian, what were you going to say? Oh. Um, and so, oh, so uh, if you're running a team, I'll do that with my sphere, but then I'll encourage my agents to do that with theirs and I'll step back. It's not about me trying to right. haul everybody. It's them, them putting forward. But if you're my buddy and you're my pal there, I'm going to do that with, with my group. Right. But my agents are going to go do it with their tribe that they brought. Right. I got a really important question for you, but before I do, I want to put a shout out there to our sponsor, uh, Wise Hire. Uh, all, all, I think all of us on the call here use Wise Hire. Uh, we love Wise Hire for both administrative hires as well as sales team members. Uh, but uh, for those of you that haven't checked them out already, go check out Wise Hire, W I Z E H I R E dot com forward slash Club Wealth. Uh, we wouldn't endorse them if we didn't have success with them. And uh, that's all I have to say. I mean, really, like, we just really love these guys. They put all our ads out there. Uh, we advertise in lots of different spots, but that's one of the ones that uh, gives us the greatest return. Uh, in fact, I just recently had another one last week. We did another round of interviews for uh, ISAs, and uh, all we did was put a wise hire ad out there, and we had over 300 people register. Uh, we had 130 some odd people show up for our live webinar, uh, and we're hiring several out of that. So, anyway, that being said, here's my question for you. So oh now I forgot my question. Uh, it was really important too. Uh, so it's all about building the relationship. I don't know. It'll come to me. Oh my gosh. That bugs me. I totally forgot what that question was. Uh, so go ahead. Shree and Brian. You know, one question? thing I just want to echo is because it's, it's um, a lot of the team leaders, it's always hard for them to get their team so involved and get them gung ho on this. And I think we always have, we need to bring it back to it's about having that your customer experience. So the customer experience that you're trying to create within your, with your team and what your standards are, that includes your client events or your community events that you're throwing. And that makes you all look different to the general public, inviting everyone, inviting leads. Um, gosh, I don't know why people don't do that. Some people only invite their sphere and that's it. They will only call the people that they already know to come out to their client events. Go ahead. Okay, Mike. but Sheree, hold on now. So, I, and I get that. And I'm with you. And I'm, I I feel the same way you do about it. But I want to ask you, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because Brian's not. Um, so, so here's what I got to say. So what if I can't afford it? I'm just afraid so many people are going to show up. I can't afford to do a party for that many people. So I'm only going to invite the people that are in my 
really tight sphere of influence because if I invite all those leads, what if a hundred of them show up? What if you get a hundred new clients? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would initially say, but that's actually a really good thing if more people do show up. And I'll say this, we mentioned you you said about you talked about the vendors before, and I've said it in a joking fashion, but I was really serious when I said that if you're a lender, the person who you're constantly referring business to, and I want to start with the lender, uh, because there's others that we can we can get involved with this too. But number one with that lender, if that lender's not willing to help you with your client event, then get a new lender. Get a new lender. Like I was really serious when I said that. Yeah. I was very serious when I said that. I did a client event before that was at a karaoke bar. So if a whole bunch of people showed up, fantastic. I didn't have to rent space. I didn't have anything to bling out. This is back when it was just little old we be me. And people showed up and I called every single lead. It was easy. So that phone call was so much easier for me to do to invite you out. We can talk about real estate, but hey, you know what? I would love to meet you. And I'm having this on this day at this time. Yep. I'd then- love for you all to come out. We're doing a night out without the kids. Whatever that is. It's so it was pictures of soda pictures of beer, pizza, and we had a ball because the entertainment was free for me. It was karaoke. It was free. It was it was fantastic. I think right. it ended up costing maybe like 100 bucks. My lender was there too. We had like 40 some odd people that showed up and got transactions from that. We got more trans I got more transactions from the people who told me they couldn't come than from the people who could come. That's the key right there. Yep. I agree. But that wouldn't happen if I didn't make the phone call. Right. And to help. So you picked a venue. If you look at that, you picked a venue where space of collateral wasn't a big deal. I have five people or 100 people. This place can accommodate it. It doesn't look busy or poorly on me. Uh, right. And we move forward. So I just pull more tables together. Right. So part of it is, is what is the event you're doing and how can you make it flexible and adaptable? Right. Now, I did like our first event was the, the movie event. Right. We did a movie release. OK. Um, and to the point of everywhere their eyes were going. Um, I worked it out with the movie theater where there were no previews in the movie. It was just a two and a half commercial on us, us saying thank you, and then straight into the movie. But um, there I had a seat count, right? So there is having my agents drive. I need registrations, need registrations, and you just prioritize who's the first people going to go. And I'd actually do my A's and top A's in my spheres, and then do my leads because the people in the middle of your sphere may or may not come. New business, my best referral sources, and then filter down from there. So I got to tell you, you know, I want to come back to the whole lender thing. And it's not just lenders we're talking about. It's vendors in general, right? Lenders, title, escrow, home inspectors, movers, everybody that makes money when you refer them a client, which you do a lot. I got to be honest, it is morally offensive to me when a, a, a vendor refuses to participate financially in the acquisition of the clients that you send them. And I think it should be more, morally re- reprehensible. And I, frankly, I think everybody should be morally offended about this because the reality is all these people are wanting to freaking ride your coattails. They're suckling off the, the you know real estate agent teeth, if you will hoping that they'll make a great living off of your efforts. And it's like, wait a minute, hold on. We can all contribute here, right? Nobody's asking anybody to pay their unfair share. All we're asking is contribute to the cost of client acquisition so that we all succeed. And that's, there, you shouldn't be embarrassed when you ask for that. And I, and I think there's too many agents out there that are afraid to ask for it, that are embarrassed to ask for it, that feel somehow like it's wrong to ask for it because somewhere, somehow, someone made them feel like It was not okay. And I got news for you. You're running a freaking business. It's okay. Let me ask you this. If you go into anywhere, you you, you watch a movie nowadays, you can't watch a movie without a bazillion product placements inside that movie. You think they're getting paid for that? I got news for you. Every time Von Don drinks a Coca-Cola, someone's getting paid, right? And it's and you have the right. Is he still making movies? Did he really just bring him up? I don't know. I, it's a little, I don't know why that name came to my file. I've never been to one of those movies. He's a terrible actor. Curtis, because, because uh, you, actor like you that didn't rip Curtis. Do what was that? <laughs> right. Um, now, as you grow and scale and you throw success and you have, like, some social proof of the videos of it, you get the venue involved as well. Get the venue involved. Right? 
um, and wherever they're going to be. If it's you're doing it at a karaoke bar, the second time I come in, I'm going to ask them, hey, will you uh, give out some half appetizers, game terms apps, or something like that, that you will then give away as gifts when the ages come back or clients come back to this place another time, right? Get the venue involved in in supporting or having something there as well, because you're driving a ton of people at traffic, right? Right. Yeah, the venues will definitely give you discount free little giveaways, all of that, because they want those people to come back. Yeah. They want all those people who are there to come back again. Um, so, right. yeah, so definitely get that venue involved with your if they have things for the salon option, if they have something for your giveaways, um, definitely get the venue involved in that. Well, and ask yourself, what would a venue like that pay to have an extra 100 people or 200 people brought into their venue? that have not been to their venue before that would, you know, that would potentially patronize them going forward. People pay money for that. So guys, client acquisition costs money for everyone, everyone. That is the single biggest cost most businesses have is client acquisition. You are doing people a favor by helping them with that effort. Uh, and guess what? They can afford to pay for it and they should. So, all right, good stuff. I'm loving this conversation. You guys, I want to jump in really quick here. And by the way, Brian, I noticed that and we've got it. We've got a couple more uh, questions from the audience. And so I'm going to first go back to Sandy Stites comment that they, that uh, that Brian, she wants to come to one of your pie events because apparently you have really good pies and yep. or she wants to sell you the pies. So <laughs> uh, that's enough. what's that? Fair enough. I love it. All right. So Stephen Marsh says, how do you handle more people than giveaways food? Uh, and let me just think about that. I'm trying to in uh, interpret your question there, Stephen. How do you handle more people? Than so if I'm doing a pie event, and I had 200 pies and 250 show up. There you go. Oh, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. Um, well, in that case, we, you know, we actually were booking your pie order. Right. And so I should have pretty close to what, is going to show up and if not you know either have something on reserve and punt it or first come first serve we had a popular event this is, and sell it to the benefit but you know what now maybe here is where you do a drop by say hey do you know what i'll make sure you get one i'm going to love you i'm sorry i didn't have you i'm going to pour my love and soul onto you i will make sure you get one we just had a fantastic turnout more than we anticipated and guys you know what we are so glad you're here but what kind would you like and i'll make sure you get it I love that. I think that's fantastic. And, and, you know, again, I think to your point, people, see, I, there's nothing wrong with first come, first serve. There's nothing wrong with the people that show up early get incentivized, right? I mean, think about our events, right? We even, we don't even open the doors, right? But people line up and they get really excited about running in the VIPs at club wealth events. They want to run to the front and they want to get the best seats in the house. And so guess what? So we wait and we open those doors at a, at a specific time so that we create that rush to those chairs because it's exciting and it gets the blood flowing and gets people, you know, just in that mood, right? Well, you do the same thing with this, right? It's the people show up and if it's just, oh, well, there's a bazillion pies on a, on a shelf behind you and they show up and they know if I show up on time or if I show up an hour late, I'm still going to get a pie. Well, hey, there's no incentive then, right? You want them at home telling their kids, come on, Johnny, hurry up, man. I want to get a freaking pie. Let's go. So, yeah, yeah, depending upon how your food is set up or what the place is, it's okay. You know, so you, you go to some places where the food is set up kind of as a buffet. And what Michael said, if you, or it's set up out in the middle uh, where they can see what it is, they can go and grab what they decide that they want to grab. And if it runs out, Stephen, then they are going to get there earlier next time. That's right. And they do. And you know what's interesting? Sometimes they'll complain about it. Like we get this once in a while. They're like, well, Michael, I, I, I really want to buy a VIP ticket. Well, I'm sorry. They're sold out. Well, I'm upset. I'm a, I'm a tier four. I should be able to get a, 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 a VIP ticket. Well, you can just order it early next time. Like everybody else that got one this time. Right. And people get the point. And it's not, it's like, dude, like you can't, we have this many, you didn't order yours in time. I, I remember Mike Bjorkman almost, almost missed VIP for this last event. He was so bummed. He really, 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 really wanted to get it. And like the last minute, uh, he got like one of the last two or three tickets available for VIP. And he was so excited. You guys can think about that. Like, that's what we're talking about here. You want to create that excitement. If there's, if it's easy to get, nobody cares. Nobody wants it. If it's hard to get, if it's special, everybody wants it. Um, so, well, this well, is one of the, 
Right. One of the things that we did on our last client event is we created urgency and scarcity. And I'm not a wow. scarcity mindset person as a whole, but it, and it's really true. And it's kind of a funny story. So year one of our water park event, we I freaked out about three hours before it because they said that we could have 1,200 people and we didn't head count it. And I was like, oh, my God we're going to have, we're going to have to turn people away, which by the way, would have been the absolute worst thing to do. So the next year, instead of giving me an aneurysm, what we did is we actually gave tickets away. So if you, we, so we actually verified. And so we emailed people tickets that they could print out and we actually had hard copies and it's a little bit more of a logistical thing. But again, guys, how many people do you want to come to our water park event? Well, we have eight people. Great. Well, you know, that's good. We still have room. So you're in, you know, but, and then I would literally have people, you know, emailing me or calling me the day before, Hey, my sister's in town. And obviously if we had room, we'd let them come. But if not, we'd say, you know, guys, unfortunately we sold out and, it's okay to do that because again, it creates value because if everybody can come, then it's just something everybody can come to. But if you're special and you have to have a head count because this is something that costs money and this that, you know has a value. So make sure whatever you're doing, you're giving it a value so that your client appreciates it because you know, that's really one of the things that becomes it just adds so much to it. So. I love the paper ticket because it really does. It creates additional value, right? And it, and it also helps to create that urgency and scarcity. It's like, look, if you want one of these tickets, you better get it now because they're not going to be available in three weeks. You better get one right now. Um, and so I love it. I think it's fantastic you're doing that. All right. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. So we're going to go to parting thoughts. Uh, so does anybody have anything else before we go to parting thoughts that you want to make sure we cover? Okay. So let's do, let's do this. What are our final takeaways? Uh, and we'll start. And there comes Mike Bernier. Speaking of late, I'm just kidding. Hi, Mike. What's up, brother? We love you. <laughs> Coach Bernier. Uh, so final thoughts, biggest takeaways. We'll start with Brian, then go to Sheree, then Dan, and I'll wrap it up. So my thought is really simple is just do it. You know, ultimately there's 17,000 reasons why these are hard and challenging and all these things, but the only way you're really going to get any better at this is go out there and try and do it. And, you know, the, the other thing I want to say with that, this is not about getting people to show up to your event. It's about creating new conversations that don't go, do you know anyone who's looking to buy or sell real estate? It's about giving back and, communicating with people, you know, statistically speaking, 80 some percent of clients said they would work with their realtor again and 8% do. And it's not because the realtor was bad. It's because it's four years later and they can't remember your name. That's what these things are about. Yeah. They can't remember your name or your phone number at all. Um, so everything that Brian said, plus, um, one thing that I'm hearing, uh, from you, Dan is about the customer experience. And that's one thing that you always want to create is that customer experience from the time that they get there. What is their experience like? Because how they, that's how they're going to view you as an agent also. That's what they're, that's what they see. That's sometimes that's their first initial impression of you and how your team is. Is your team fun? Are, are you a nice person? Do you seem as if you're a nice person to work with? No, like, and trust. So know you, like you, then we can work on the trust. Oh, not that finger. Then we can work on the trust, you know, later on down. <laughs> but don't forget that, that Disney feel. I, you know, I think back to going to Disney World with my only uh, niece and standing there and just start dancing around in the street with her. Why? Because that was at Disney and it was fun and it was nice. And I loved being there. Um, that's what you want to have a uh, world-class customer experience for your clients, for your vendors, for the, for your team members, for the charity that's there for everyone that's there, um, to experience that. Um, yep, exactly. Um, all right. So as you create your events, find multiple ways to get hooks into them, right? So the last one I did was an open skate. We had an ice skating, ice skating rink, and I had pictures with Santa, and I had the frozen uh, scouts out there for pictures on ice and that type of thing. We had the silent auction. I had vendor booths, right? So multiple hooks to capture data on them so you're collecting them so you can retarget them later, but make it all about them and control their feet, feet and eyes, where their feet and eyes go, and you'll be doing just fine. Love it. 
you know, for those of you that are watching that want to know exactly how to do this, want a checklist to follow to be able to accomplish exactly what we're talking about here, uh, I've posted a link in the Facebook uh, chat there. It's uh, clubwealth.com forward slash client dash appreciation dash event dash marketing. Yeah, it's a fun one. Uh, but at least the link's in there, so all you got to do is click on it. You don't have to remember it. But I will tell you, if you go to that the webpage, there's a, a one-hour uh, educational video on there on exactly how to do this. But you can also just simply download the free checklist. doesn't cost anything. Uh, get that free checklist, follow it. And let me tell you, that's the starting point. When you do that and you really just follow that checklist to a T, you'll get results that are better and better and better each time. And before you know it, you'll have 850 people at your next event. So that being said, I really appreciate all of you guys, Brian, Cherie, Dan, seriously, all of you. Thank you so much. Not only do I appreciate you being on Club Wealth TV, but I really appreciate you guys doing all you do for Club Wealth. And all you do for your clients as coaches in Club Wealth, seriously, you guys give back more than anybody can even begin to ask for. So thank you so much for that. Uh, for those of you that have not uh, done this already, subscribe to our podcast at clubwealth.com forward slash TV, clubwealth.com forward slash TV. Go ahead and subscribe to that. And you can listen to these types of broadcasts uh, on your whatever device you listen to them on and uh, enjoy it while you're working out, driving, walking, doing whatever it is you do. That being said, have an awesome day, everybody. And remember, inside each one of you, there's a world-class beast just dying to get out. So you got to unleash that beast. So go do it. Unleash that beast today and find something. Go to a world-class level. Take care, everybody.